What is good, everyone? Welcome to the Outside the Box podcast. My name is Nick Ingvall. If this is your first time checking out the podcast, uh, this is a podcast about sneakers, but it's not necessarily about the, what's releasing, what's hot and what's not. I like to talk about the kind of ins and outs of the business, talk to people that work in the footwear industry, talk to people that have had interesting journeys throughout the footwear industry, and kind of give you a different way to think about sneakers. On this episode, I get to talk to my friend Megan Ann Wilson. And what I love about our conversation is the many dif- different aspects of the business that she's worked in. And, and we talked about her journey. We talked about how she just likes to try things out and kind of see what works. And, and I really find it fascinating because she's she's been a uh, she's been a archivist for a sports you know media company. She's been a designer. She's been a stylist for professional athletes all over the world. She's been uh, I mean she's just done a lot of cool shit. And I think that is what I get out of this conversation. But. We talk about her journey, we talk about her going to footwear design school, we talk about her being on the first ever, to my knowledge, reality sneaker TV show, Um, and yeah, it's just an incredible conversation, and we talk about sustainability, some of the design projects that she's working on now, and some of the things that we can do to kind of make the world a little bit better place through sneakers, and through our purchases, and through our actions in sneakers, but I, I really appreciate that we talked about how not to get burnt out when it comes to talking about sustainability, whether that's the food you eat or the things that you do to make your life more sustainable. Because if you get burnt out, you're not sustainable. Simple as that. It was a great conversation. I hope you really, I really hope you enjoy it. If you enjoy the podcast, it would mean a lot to me if you would leave a review on on Apple Podcasts, perhaps subscribe on Audible or Google or Spotify or wherever else you listen to the podcast. If you're on YouTube, Thanks for watching, and uh, it would be awesome if you could hit that like like button and that subscribe button so we can continue to grow this podcast and have more of these conversations with more interesting people down the road. So I appreciate you all, and without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Megan Ann Wilson. Hey, what's good, everybody? Welcome back to the Outside the Box podcast. Today, I've got a special guest with me to uh, talk about some some different areas of the sneaker business that I haven't touched on with anyone yet. So, Megan, welcome to the show. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm just, you know, socially distanced in my apartment, looking at the snow outside in New York. We have more snow here than in Canada, so it's been an interesting couple of weeks. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's been uh, it's it's been like probably the last three or four times I've recorded have been like conversations with people in the snow where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I miss it in a sense. Like I, I, the one thing that I do really miss about New York was I used to go wander around the city and just like, you know, cause there's nobody out. So it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, You get to just kind of see this empty city, but I'm also super thankful that I'm not digging, but I didn't have to dig myself out this morning to take the dog for a walk. So I, yeah, <laughs> but you got pluses um, and minuses, right? <laughs> yep, yep. I just, I just kind of always say like, I'd rather, I'd rather be able to drive to the snow than have to deal with it straight out of my front door. So that's kind of the way I, I tend to lean. But, um, mm-hmm. so I guess since you know we've known each other for quite a while, it's probably been yeah, man, it's probably been like twelve or so years. Uh, I give a little background into like what you do and how you got into sneakers. Yeah. Um, so now in the past like couple years, I'm doing a lot more um, design and product development, focus more on sustainability. Um, and I specifically kind of work at the intersection of sports, fashion and sneakers. And now sustainability has been part of it and just trying to kind of not necessarily reinvent, but kind of like pivot the manufacturing process. So it's just better on people, better on the environment and, and sustainable in the sense it will be around forever, you know, not that it's how it is now or it's waste, waste, waste. Right. Um, but originally I got into sneakers, um, because, I partially because of sports and things like that. I st- what like a lot of, you know, people I'm 35 now, but I was on, you know, whether it was Nike talk or live journal and all these different forums, like super future talking about shoes and because of a mix of, you know, loving basketball, but also being a skateboard kid. Um, and I originally got into actually working in sneakers because I started a blog and through Twitter, um, through she got game. And then I ended up writing about basketball style and sneakers for the basketball, uh, blog at the score when it was still a TV, 
uh, station and not just nap. Um, so I started writing about that. And then from there, I did more and more blogging, had my own blog, um, the She Got Game blog, um, originally on WordPress. And then it just kind of went from there and eventually came to New York, studied sneaker design. And then I had already been styling here and there. Um, and that's when I realized like, hey, I, you know, I want to do um, style and sneakers with a sports influence rather than working in sports and kind of focusing on that. And from there, it kind of, you know, grew and changed and to where I am now. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it's, it's, it's been crazy too, because like, I think, you know, you are one of those people, like we're very similar in a sense that we just like see all this stuff going on. And we're like excited to get involved in it. And like, totally. I, I really admire that you've kind of chased a lot of those things to, to, you know, I don't, think of it as like, you have to chase it and do this to certain level of success. I think like, it's best if you see something you like and go check it out as yeah. far as you need to, to either decide I'm going to go further with this, or I'm going to step back and try this other thing. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think that gets lost in like translation to the younger generation that looks up to the people that, you know, that see you or I going to events in the normal life and like thinking about how do they get involved but it's like sometimes that process is really kind of fascinating to me because not everybody is even willing to step outside of that comfort zone to look at what else is there even if it's even if it's right there in the in the next lane over and they can clearly see there's some some cool things happening but um i i guess like how did the how did the blog kind of um you know, facilitate some of the stuff that happened because, you know, we, we both kind of came up in a time where like blogs were a huge deal, right? Like I yeah. would say probably the most important aspect of the internet at the moment, right? It was like right before Twitter came on or right as Twitter was kind of becoming a thing, there was no Instagram. Yeah. Um, and so like, what was it like doing that on your own? How did you approach it? And then also like, I know that turned into, you know, opportunities for you to kind of like make yeah. money in this that you didn't have before. So how, walk us through a little bit of that, I guess. Yeah. Um, so in terms of starting the blog, it, it was something that I was always passionate about being someone that grew up, you know, watching sports and always being excited about the jerseys, about shoes and things like that. And it really started because I was, work when I was working at the score, originally an archivist. So basically, you know, the job is to look through all this tape and find different pieces to give to the editors and give to the reporters and really build a story from a visual standpoint and sometimes from audio, but you know, if there's like a really great call, you know, like, oh, I know that dunk, you know, we would broadcast, you know, record different broadcasts, like, you know, like, let's say the Giants one, we're like, okay, Okay, let's get that Giants local broadcast because we know that's going to sound better than like Joe Buck or whatever, right? Yeah. So it was really about, you know, really getting really granular in some ways about sports. And within that, because I had studied um, radio and television arts at Ryerson and done a semester abroad in Germany during the World Cup, that's when I started doing more design courses and I was doing making up my own kind of like costume design and art direction courses at Ryerson. They have them now, but at the time they were like, yeah, you can have a credit if you just like run the art department. Cool. Like I just wanted to be more creative, you know, within broadcasting because there are certain parameters, like it's gotta be two minutes. You gotta go to air, you know, it's a, it can be really structured. Um, so when I came back um, and I was pretty much ready to go study fashion and really go whole hog. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm definitely, you know, I've always wanted to be a designer. I didn't think I had the skills. I'm going to go to school. And I got accepted to a program in Montreal um, and then I got offered a job at the score. So I took that job and I was like, okay, I'll start styling on the side. I'll start doing that. So as I was doing that as like a side job while working in archives, I would complain all the time about like jerseys, about sneakers, and I would constantly be talking about it. And this is 2007. So right around when Twitter was starting up. And so being in a newsroom, they're like, you should join Twitter. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll tweet here. And then it was like, you know, just, oh, I'll be she got game because sneakers and you know, basketball and sports and game can be style, game can be sports, cool, right? And so it started from there. And as I started tweeting, I realized, slowly started building a following. It's not like now, you know, everyone talks about sports and fashion, but there were no tunnel locks. There were no, you know, at this point, st players were starting to hire stylists, but it wasn't really known. People didn't really realize, you know, LeBron had hired Rachel and that D-Wade was trying to work with Kellyanne. Like this wasn't a niche that was really explored yet. So I started blogging about it because basically everyone who worked with me was like, okay, we get it, write about it. You know, and it just became an outlet for me. So more and more 
um, I started doing it and I started, you know, styling more and offering to style some of the on-air talent. And, you know, it was a way to then meet, um, you know, athletes and, and have a bridge. And because Twitter was still so new, it was a lot more personal. Like now it's so massive. Like, is this person really who they are? But at that point, I feel like there was kind of like more of an authenticity because people were still learning how to use it. You know, it was kind of that early yeah. adopter stage. So that was kind of, you know, fun to be a part of. So at that point, like I said, I was, you know, started writing for, uh, it was called Nothing Easy after Zaza Petrulia, the basketball blog at the score. Later, um, Basketball Jones, and now they're the starters, came on. And so I kind of, you know, contributed for them. Um, so, you know, and that was kind of like my my side hustle in that sense. So I didn't really fully monetize it until when I kind of had that realization where I was like, you know, I'm really tired. I was at that point at the score, I was an assignment editor. So it's like bringing in feeds and like basically also being kind of like a mom to like reporters in the field, like here's your hotel, here's here, you know, like, and I was okay at it. But there was, you know, I would I would basically work those shifts and then give myself a press pass, go report about style and go interview Amari, you know, like that what I would do for fun, you know, when I wasn't working. So it just got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to find another outlet. So I had started blogging a bit for um, some other, you know, sneaker blog sites, and I was getting to know people like you and other people in the community. Um, and, you know, writing for different outlets. And eventually I was like, I really want to, you know, start blogging more and maybe look into design or styling full time. Um, so basically, I tried to get fired. And then I used my severance from getting fired to go to the Oscar game in LA. And so that was the first time I got paid as like, uh, you know, like a roving reporter. And that's like when leaning and um, a few other like Chinese brands had their first unveiling. So I, I have all these videos and Ron Artest had his when he launched ball in. So it was like this yeah. weird time in, in sneakers where there was if you were willing to like, kind of put the time in, and be super passionate about it. there was a lot of stuff to cover because not many people were kind of like really there it wasn't like now where everyone was talking about it there was still a lot of you know room to grow and i firmly believe too like everyone can have a niche there's room for everybody you know but there, it was just like a good time to be in it like you said it were really exploding so at that point i was like okay what i'm gonna do so i would write for a few sneaker sites um and then eventually going um and studying uh pencil up parsons um, and studying sneaker design because I wanted to feel like not only, like, you know, could I be a footwear designer, but also I wanted to make sure I had that authority because I was definitely, you know, a bit of like a know it all and a huge nerd. And it was just like, OK, I want to learn everything. I want to know everything. I want to, you know, make sure I feel like an authority. I think that's partially just because when you love something, you want to learn everything. At least that's me. But also being a woman in the industry, people automatically thought because, oh, well, you didn't go to college to play basketball. You must not know anything really about basketball. Why can you talk about it if you don't play? You know, when there's plenty of guys who talk about basketball who've never played. But, you know, I knew that there was a little bit of that, like, let me make sure I can be as informed, but also, you know, it, it's not it's still a bit tricky now, but there's not like a platform like here's every job in the footwear industry. You know, I didn't really know where to start. So I figured pencil was a good way. Um, and then after doing that, that's how I kind of got my first NBA client because I, I pitched that project to Chris Douglas Roberts and he liked it so much. Then I did a few like free errands as like exchange for like his feedback, like go to flight club. And I was like, oh, I'm already going to all these places. I know all these like sneaker nerds in New York. We're cool, you know, um, and it expanded my network. And I stayed in New York for a summer. And by the time I left that summer, I actually at a cafe down the street, I wrote my first contract for Chris. And then I went back to Canada so I could legally start working for him. So that was kind of how the transition. So for me, it was just it came from such a point of you know, like passion and also seeing this niche that wasn't filled, you know, there weren't a lot of people writing about it. It was, there was like UniWatch, there were a few guys and most of the other analysis that was out there would be like hot, not cool. Like very, <laughs> not really like leak fits now, but it wasn't real in depth. It wasn't like, oh, this is from this Prada line. That's why it's interesting. Here's where it got sourced. You know, there wasn't a lot of depth to the coverage. And I was like, oh, I can, I can get in there and also, you know, basically teach myself to be a stylist because that's, it's something that you don't really go to school for, you know, yeah. um, there are some programs here and there, but I just kind of learned as I went and I didn't really have anyone I could, you know, intern with in Toronto that I knew that especially were, especially in menswear, maybe there's a bit more now, but when I was coming up there, it was mostly just, you know, women's wear editorial and, and that was it. So I just kind of trained myself and went from there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, interesting to think about how little there was 
of that kind of, you know, like you said, the tunnel walks, like now yeah. you see multiple pictures of every athlete, like, you know, yeah. during that time, you were lucky if you saw, you know, I feel like that was like the just Jared era of the internet, you know, where it was like, yeah. if you saw an athlete, you saw them, if you saw an athlete outside of whatever sport they were in, you saw them in like some New York or Hollywood street shot that some, yeah. you know, other blog was already covering, right? It wasn't like, yeah. hey, what are these guys wearing off the court, right? And I think like, that's kind of an interesting thing about where the NBA has gone to, like just being, you know, an Allen Iverson fan all my life and like watching him basically be shunned because of how he dressed yeah. off the court. And then to come to this point where like, now the NBA has to like acknowledge that, hey, this is like, this is, we're not selling basketball shoes the way we were, you know, I, I know that like those are different companies, but like in general, they're not yeah. thinking about like that, but they are thinking about like, hey, you know, uh, cactus plant flea market or whatever these other yeah. hot brands are that need to be shown off the court mm -hmm. because they're trying to latch on to some of that energy that comes with these, you know, collaborations and these other creative, yeah. you know, people that are out there and the players want that too. So you can see like the, you know, just the, the trying to connect things. And it's really interesting too, because like on one hand, like I'm sure that whole world of, you know, since you were so early to it, it was probably super challenging to just even find the right people to work with and people that understood the value of it. Mm -hmm. But then it's also probably, you know, at least for me personally, it seems like mo a more exciting opportunity to get into the design world yeah. anyway, right? Because it's almost because everybody's doing it. Like you said, there's always room. And I totally believe the same thing. It's like, there's so much going on. Like, there's going to be a thousand people eventually doing the same thing on the internet. They yeah. they have no connection to each other whatsoever, but it's just the nature of human interaction at this point. But, you know, what was it like, you know, trying to, I, like my assumption is it's like a, like you're dealing with like big personalities on that side of things. Right. So like you as a stylist trying to say, Hey, this is something that has value that you might not understand mm -hmm. as an, coming from a, an athlete's perspective. And, and then, you know, vice versa, like you probably having to, you know, reel it in sometimes. And so like, what were yeah. some of the challenges for you d dealing with the athletes on that level? And then I guess like, how did you end up, you know, kind of moving towards the design stuff after, you know, as that kind of progressed for you? Yeah, well, so much of it came from building that network. And, and, you know, I don't want to, I want to make sure I don't understate that I don't think I would have a career without Twitter, or I don't think I would have the same career without Twitter, you know, and I, I, I definitely know that, especially when you're younger, there's that if you're an independent entrepreneur, it's like, I'm self made, I did it all on my own. But like, I know I wouldn't be where I was without my network, without Twitter, without, you know, people taking a chance to work with me without going to pencil, you know, all these things. And, you know, now that I'm older, it's way easier for me to look back and be like, Oh, they were right. Or Oh, yes, that's what I, I should have done more of like, my, you know, I could go through all the regrets I have for blog days. Like, why didn't I post more? Why didn't I go to this event? Or why didn't, you know, like I, all that. But it, it was really about network in the sense that, you know, um, getting to know people on Twitter and, and so many of us who are on basketball Twitter still were there, you know, like 10, 12 years ago, um, like when we met and that really became part of it. It was, you know, photographers and social media guys, reporters, got to know me as the fashion girl, you know? So if they saw like Jimmy Goldstein at a game, they'd be like, here's a photo. What do you think? Oh, here's what Russ is wearing. You know, guys would tweet me and be like, hey, Megan, what's he wearing? Like still a couple times a week, I have someone messaging me being like, hey, can you tell me what this guy is wearing? And I don't do as much of that anymore, partially because I, I don't have the bandwidth. But you know, that was something that I was known for. And part of that, especially when I was coming up, it was, it was almost like you kind of have to put yourself out there a lot, you know, you have to give a lot of energy so people know, okay, you're the person rather than doing it once a week. It was like every day I have to be on. Like I remember tweeting about Russell Westbrook's, you know, like fishing lure, Lacoste shirt when I was in the hospital because I got a concussion, you know, like I was just so obsessive about it because, you know, to me, I felt not that I had like a responsibility to tweet about it, but I was like, this is really what you know, really drives me forward. And at that time, when I first started, I don't think I necessarily saw a full big picture. 
Um, and now I can look back and be like, oh, you know, it might have taken me a while to get where I am in my career now, but now it's like it, it informs a lot of the work I do in design and development, right? Um, so definitely in, in the sense that it was hard, sometimes it was hard because a lot of people, and I think you still see it now, but not as much, right? You know, people be like, who gives a shit about what a guy is wearing? Like, why do we care about his outfit? Why does this matter? You know, oh, it's flip it. You know, I think a lot of people, and you see that even with people talking about sports who aren't sports fans, like, oh, I don't get it. Oh, this game is stupid. You know, it's, it's not for everyone, you know? And I think that was something I had to realize that even if certain broadcasters or certain people I pitched didn't get it, that doesn't mean nobody gets it. You know, you really, you're, And part of it, too, is when you're early to something, you have to remind yourself, like, yeah, you'll get 10 no's, but if you get one really great yes, that's worth it. You know, you just kind of have to kind of stay the course and also remember, like, oh, is this something I'm really passionate about? Do I like doing this? Okay, and that'll kind of, you know, keep you going because part of being early is that you are going to fight, you know, with people to be like, this is is good content. This is interesting. Like, look at the response, you know. Um, and part of it too is just building a network. So that that was probably the most frustrating stuff going on. You know, I would go to events and they'd be like, "We're not going to cover fashion." And a year and a half later, they'd have a fashion reporter. You know, so it it was something that it was difficult for me. And it's you know, it's easier to sometimes blame like, "Oh, if only I was a model, or if only I you know worked for this network." You know, but um, for me, it just came about like, okay, let's, let's kind of like stay true and, and build from there. But I mean, I know I couldn't have got there without, uh, like a certain, like reaching out to a network and kind of building that. And there are, like I said, like certain things I was like, oh, I wish I was more targeted or more careful or more consistent. But like, those are lessons that you take and, you know, you grow later. But I think, yeah, it was, uh, part of being early too, it was, it was exciting because, you started realizing people would then constantly ask you questions. Like even today, um, you know, my best friend Terrence is like, does the league still have a dress code? He's like, I think you're the only one who knows. Like, (laughs) you know, like we still talk about this, you know, constantly. It's still a constant conversation, you know. All right. So Um, Terrence, you're coming on the show with me. Yeah. I know he's going to listen, so. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I literally, I, I'm like, oh, I should probably text him back, whatever. But, um, but it's, you know, it's it's one of those things. And that's someone I've also known about, you know, over 10 years um, because of Twitter. So, yeah. I mean, I think we need to kind of, I think the other lesson too, in terms of like being early is like, look to your network. And I think so often we want something that like, oh, if I only get, know this person, if I only reach this person, like, the Issa Rae said something about like building with like your community and building at like your level and not always worrying about like chasing like oh I need to talk to the president like well maybe your friend's the VP maybe you can work together you know what I mean like this idea of like working together sharing resources seeing where it goes like I think it's good to be competitive against yourself and having standards but I don't think you have to compete with everyone in the industry because that can end up you know really backfiring the other tricky thing too was in terms of like sneaker trips and you know being there is often there would always be a rotation of one token girl you know like one one trip would be jazzy then be me and then then maybe it was anna later when she came up you know like it was always like this weird rotation of like bringing people in now it's a little more inclusive and now i'm seeing you know more girls at events but that was also part of it was understanding and at the time being okay with like being passed over but you had to realize that a lot of these big brands aren't going to be really able to change right away <laughs> and really able to adapt right away. And I think that's one of the great things about the NBA. And one of the reasons, yeah, I've worked with in the NFL and baseball and hockey and MMA and all these different sports, right? But basketball has always been about, yeah, it's a team sport, but they do celebrate the player because you can actually see them on court. There's not a giant helmet. Occasionally there's a face yeah. mask, but, you know, it's, it's, there's so, they do a, not always perfect, but they do a good job of marketing single players, right? So I think for me, it felt like the most direct way to talk about fashion. And it's the reason why I think it's, you know, Eclipse Soccer as like the big fashion sport, right? It's been the one that people look to. And then the NFL started kind of copying them. Now the NHL and the MLB kind of are. Um, So I think being in, in basketball was also really advantageous for me. Because I think if I tried to do it in the NFL, who are really rigorous about like, you have to wear either you know, um, one of these brand polos, if you're going to be here, like they're a lot more strict about dress codes and stuff. So I think part of it too is, is timing, right? Because this is, like you said, 
this is when players, because of Allen Iverson, we had the dress code, right? And then this was when players were coming back to finding their side. And now they wear outfits. If they want to wear a suit, they do. But they would have never done this, you know, a few years ago because their whole idea was like, I don't have to wear a suit anymore. I'm going to figure out my way around the dress code. And I used to have players tell me, um, it's a former Mavericks coach, I won't say which one, when players were not behaving well, he was like, oh, we're taking away dress code. You have to wear hard bottom shoes for the next week. And that was one way they like incentivize their players Wow! was they use the dress code as like a way to penalize players. That's so crazy. it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so when I heard that, I was like, I had, cause one of my clients would be like, can you send me a bunch of like these kind of shoes? Cause we're not allowed to wear them cause we've lost so many in a row. And I was like, are you serious? You know, but that became a, a bargaining chip for, I think it's a bad bargaining chip. I don't, I think that's a sign of a bad coach personally, but um, you know, but it was, it's interesting to wow. see kind of like how style was used, even if the media, like the general media didn't understand it. Those of us were kind of in the know with sneakers or that sort of thing, you know, with you, like, you know, with like, um, on Soul Club or like watching what people are wearing every time or on, you know, with sneaker history and you guys covering that yeah. stuff, like we notice those things, but the general media doesn't. And it's really interesting when you realize like how much of the business revolves around it. <laughs> yeah. So it was also like a really great learning process in how sports marketing works and how design can work and how it can really affect, you know, both on court and off the court. Yeah, most definitely. And the, the points you make about like kind of being early to something too, and just like the nature of, of, you know, questioning yourself and, and everything as you go along. I mean, it happens to, to everyone, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I threw out the idea of doing a complex sneakers podcast in 2012 or whatever that was that I was working at complex, oh, I believe you know, it. and like, <laughs> you know, I mean, when I went there, we didn't even have the social handles for complex sneakers. I was like, we need these for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it was still all new. Right. And it's nothing against those guys. Like, you know, but at the same time, I totally understand because they're trying to stay focused in the lanes that they were already approaching. Right. And, yeah. um, but that's also part of what kind of, I think, I think that because people that consume the content that, you know, you or I create or a, a complex or the score or whomever, those people see five, 10, 20 people doing very similar things. And they think everybody's copying one another. And it's like, that's not actually how it works. Everybody's voice yeah. is is unique and i think that's the thing that i'd i'd love to get to with sneakers at some point where we can actually celebrate the voices within sneakers and yeah. not even within but like the, the the people that have interest in sneakers all have unique perspectives and that's something that i i miss about like the earlier days i guess of sneakers because in, in twitter specifically because you did really yeah. have the ability to kind of like hone in on hey this is what you're going to probably know me for now you know, 10 years later, I'm like, I don't want to be always known for sneakers. I want to post my dog yeah. sometimes. And, and Instagram is like, no, we're not going to show that post to anyone because it's not sneakers. But like, it's just a part of yeah. the game that you play as creating content on the internet. But it's, yeah. it's one of those things too, that I think it always happens. Right. And it's, it's like, you know, the, I don't look at anybody as competition. I, I you know, for me, yeah. I, I understand people that, that, find motivation in that because certain people are just kind of wired that way. And in certain aspects yeah. of my life, I'm very much that way, but not when it comes to the internet. Uh, I just am, I'm not at all. It's like, look, I can get in that mode. And when I do, like I'm, I'm very yeah. competitive, but most of the time I'm like, look, I just want to do this because I enjoy it. And I want to focus on enjoying it, focus on introducing people to this, bringing people up onto my team to be on the podcast or, you know, write for me or write on a project on my, you know, my real work get, that I get paid for and all those things. <laughs> but it's just one of those things where, you know, you see so many people kind of just like feel, feel like, Oh, I already had that idea. And it's like, yeah, the reality is like, it's kind of all out there unless, you know, somehow you are in a bubble and, and don't see other people like, you know, nothing really is new, right? There are certain little twists exactly. that become new, but like, it's all the same thing and everybody has a unique voice. And I think that's something that, you know, is, is really kind of fascinating about your journey too, because one of the things that I, you know, always have kind of, like I said, admired about you is like your ability to kind of shift gears and, and change and take on different things, right? Because part of that is just like the nature of 
like I think both of us kind of coming up in that same time frame of like, look, you just got to hustle until you find where it hits. Right. Like you said, you're going to have 10 no's before you get a yes. And sometimes it's going to be a hundred no's before you get a yes. But that one, yes, it might lead to 10 more yeses in the next six months. So you got to take that opportunity too. But, um, so I guess like kind of shifting away from the style aspect of, of what you were doing and like looking at where you're at now, um, how, how did the whole pencil thing come to be? Yeah. So, um, like I had mentioned before, I was kind of looking for, you know, an outlet and in a way to combine sports and fashion and sneakers. And, you know, I had always made clothes going up, growing up and I went, actually went to three high schools cause I got kicked out of sort of my first one because I wouldn't wear uniforms. Um, and my parents got impeached off this teacher council, student te- like the parent teacher council because we voted against it. It was like so much drama. Um, so I went to three high schools um, and I was always, you know, the girl who tried to, you know, combine fashion and, and skateboarding and, you know, all the, all the weird things. And now I realize that's, it's actually like kind of a sign of ADD and it's also, you know, intersections and finding unique niches is, you know, something that has defined my career. So I was doing that early. I just, you know, didn't, didn't have the hindsight to see it. Um, so pencil came about because I kind of saw the program and I, I hadn't heard about it before, but Parsons, um, was always kind of one of my dream schools. So in the early days of like Project Runway and all this stuff, like it was at Parsons, it was known as like, you know, one of these premier design schools, but going to Parsons is like, as an international student, which I would have been as a Canadian at the time, I think was 25 to 50 grand a year, US for one year out of four years. Um, And I was like, there's no way I can afford that. Um, But they had the summer course. And at the time it was pencil. I think they've only done it once. They did did a summer program at Parsons where it was a month kind of long intensive program. So I was like, okay, this could be a great way of seeing if I can work in footwear design, of seeing what I need to know, um, and kind of deciding if like maybe I want to do a master's. You know what I mean? And and, and kind of get my feet Mm -hmm. wet. Because at that point I had, I definitely, I'll say this, I definitely thought I knew a lot more than I did, you know, and I was, I think we all have those humbling stages and I was 25, going to be 26. So for me, that was a big pivot year, right? I was leaving the score and I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what's this next step going to be? I was blogging a bunch. I was doing some styling, but I was like, how can I kind of find a way to make my sports fashion love more legit? So I ended up um, applying and going and, you know, for the most part, it was mostly, Um, industrial design students that were, you know, probably like five years younger than me who were doing it as a summer program and they were like product designers and they wanted to do a footwear specific program rather than, you know, people who were older who were like, I mean, now I'm like, oh my God, I was so young. But, you know, (laughs) at the time I felt so old when everyone was like 1920, you know, and so I was like, okay, like, and they all had a slightly different skill set. I was the only one that kind of came from blogging and styling rather than hardcore design. So, the first week was, you know, and pencil then is different than it is now. Now you kind of have different streams, right? So you have footwear design. So the closest I would say to that would be like an industrial or product design. So that's what people think of when they think of footwear design. It's like, you know, very clear sketches. It's it's the technical side of things. Yeah, there are is an aesthetic element, but part of it is making sure, you know, it's balanced, it's symmetrical, that kind of thing. Um, then there's material color design and finishing. So that's like, you know, when someone says they do a collab, but they pick the colors, that would be like a material design project. It wouldn't necessarily be a footwear design project. So that's, you know, um, sometimes graphics over the shoe that's picking different textiles, um, that kind of thing. And then there's brand, brand design. So that is what we'd probably call, I mean, I guess it's kind of like a sports marketing kind of thing where it's putting together the decks, it's pitching the product, it's putting together a narrative and it's taking like, okay, what's the story? And then how can we reflect that in the footwear and the materials and color? Um, And it's also really kind of being like a collaborative force within footwear uh, design. Um, And part of it too, I mean, there is like certain design elements, but a lot of it is, is really based on putting together the narrative, you know? So like at Nike, often you'll get, and certain so certain other footwear places, you know, you'll get a marketing brief and you design around it. And sometimes you'll have the design and then you'll get a brief and you'll work it in. Right. So it's kind of that same idea. And uh, Dwayne and Suzette, who founded Pencil, they both come from Jordan brand. So I think they took a lot of those elements, you know, into it. And then it, there's also an apparel design um, line, too, but they didn't have that. And I haven't taken that course, so I can't really speak to it. So when I was at Parsons, it was you had one week of kind of like, 
I guess you would call it brand design in history. So you talked about like, you know, people who like the pigeon dunk release, you talked about, um, you know, how, how kind of like a brief works to an extent. I don't fully remember it cause it's like 10 years ago. Um, but it was very different from now. And then we got into sketching and it was all by hand. There was like no computer drafting. There was none of that. Like now it's all in illustrator and you know, that kind of thing and in design and none of that. Um, and I am terrible at hand sketching I'm a little better now, but basically we got teamed up with like, um, you know, another designer and I got teamed up with like the best one. So I was like, Oh my God, I'm terrible. You know? And I was so used to working in, you know, broadcasting or even coming from styling. What was like, you don't necessarily talk about the process. It wasn't like how it is now where it's all about behind the scenes and let me show you what I'm doing. It was like, here's the finished product. Here we go. But so much of design is revision, revision, revision. It's learning how to take feedback. It's learning how to give feedback. It's learning when not to take certain feedback, you know, and I didn't know how to take a critique. I didn't know how to separate like my own personal feelings about a project from someone trying to help me make it better. And you know, the big difference between, let's say, a bad critique is someone saying, that's ugly. And I don't mean in that they're saying something mean, but it's shallow. There's no, oh, it's beautiful because this line, you know, reflects your story here. Like, that's a better critique, right? So there was, yeah. I had to learn how to be more constructive. And I could do that when it came to fashion, but I hadn't fully understood how to do it in design, you know? And fashion, and Dwayne always said to me, like, fashion design and sneaker design are not at all related. You know, fashion's all about lines and, you know, emotions and color. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't like fashion design. And <laughs> this is his own bias, too, and I love Dwayne. But, you know, everyone, everyone has a background, right? Um, and he's an amazing, you know, footwear designer. But then fashion design, you know, isn't as precise. It isn't as clear sometimes. And it's, yeah, you make patterns, but, you know, there are definitely people, fashion designers, who can't, who can't draft a pattern to save their life. So... It yeah. was really hard. It was very humbling because I had to really learn, you know, how to hand sketch and how to work with proportion and, and something I'm, I'm still not great at, but also part of it was really empowering that I was like, oh, I can collaborate with people who are good at this and I still have good ideas. I can do the brand design. I can do the materials. And it really clicked when Suzette came and it was only a couple of days, but finally I felt like really seen by it because it was like, okay, like, um, you know, we're going to take these swatches and like, this is where the technology can come in. So I was like, oh, I can still be forward thinking and use materials. I can still, you know, understand trend and show it in color. For me, I can still, you know, design and work in footwear, but it's just my strength was not on the industrial side. And I didn't really put that together till the end of the project. And my project was, you know, designing a luxury sneaker for, for Tom Ford. And at the time they had none. I went to the boutique at Madison Avenue and it was like, okay, well, how would you do it if you did do it? Oh, how do you do your shoes? Like, would you do a bespoke program? And that time there were, I think they bespoke at Nike, what was probably what, like end of 2000s, right? Yeah. Or like. Yep. I want to say like, so, so it was around then, but there wasn't a lot of programs like that. So to me, I was like, oh, this is going to be high end Nike bespoke, you know, and most people didn't even know you could get those appointments. You had to really be a, you know, a shoe yep. nerd and want to spend, what was it like over a thousand dollars to get a custom AF1, you know, and, yeah. and pick those swatches. So for me, that's how I kind of envisioned it. And I was like, oh, the only people that would buy this are athletes. You know, to me, that was a perfect customer. And then I used that to kind of, and I used my Twitter network because I had interviewed Chris before and I was like, hey, I'll name it after you. You know, really it was like, let me appeal to his ego. You know, that's what athletes love, you know. Um, so it was a great way to, then I learned how to take feedback and how to work in, you know, an athlete's, um, you know, wants and needs for something that wasn't on court, but that was personal. And so I kind of, and then when I pitched it, Soleil, who was at um, Versace, and I think he's freelance now, was like, oh, this would totally work. This makes sense from a sports marketing brief. Like, this is where probably it's going. Like, you know, I think a lot of luxury brands are starting to do sneakers. Then he start, did all the luxury sneakers for Versace, you know? So I was like, oh, my yeah. God, this guy is a, and understands my brain. Like, he gets it. Like, you know, and, and I've really admired his career path. So him, at that point, I think he was at Cole Haan. So him just mm -hmm. coming in and, and getting the project was super affirming for me. And I don't think I realized it at the time, like how much I you know, needed to hear that. Cause although a lot of the other designers that I worked with were like, oh, this is like a, you know, super technical forward thinking. It was really cool. But mine was one where I was like, okay, I want to actually, I understand these markets, will this sell? And I, that's when I was like, oh, I, I understand product marketing. I understand this. Even if I didn't fully even get it when I was pitching it, 
now I can look back. I was like, oh, I understood. And now within like three years, Tom Ford had sneakers and a couple of them kind of look like the one I designed. So it goes back to that idea like, yeah, I don't think they copied me at all. I don't think even anyone in the boutique probably talked to them. But when a lot of things are happening, like you're going to catch on to trends. Just because you two people have the same idea doesn't mean you copied each other. A lot yep. of things happen at the same time. You know, you, you might have come from different inspiration points. I think that's why now I love reading all those really in-depth inspirations and i'm really picky with sneakers now because i'm like i want to see the whole story in the design i want to see it in the color i want to see it in the packaging you know that's when i think a shoe is really amazing and why i love footwear so much is that you can really have an entire narrative in something that you can wear that's functional like what other piece of clothing does it nothing nothing does you know so yeah. outside of maybe like a car but even then like you can't put a car in your bag and bring it up somewhere. You know? <laughs> like, it's like shoes are so iconic in that sense, you know, especially in sneakers. So for me, that was, it was really humbling, but it was really great because it really showed me other opportunities because it's now you can kind of see on like the Nike links and listen to podcasts and, you know, go on clubhouse and find out other sneaker jobs. But it was really hard to understand what does a footwear designer actually do? You know, what does a developer do? And even then it's still not, it can change from company to company. You know, a developer at Nike is going to be different than a developer at an upstart brand, you know? So yeah. it's, it's very specific to the industry, but it's also can be really company specific. So pencil was a really great education. And then later I did the, the reality show in Portland that was at pencil and it was kind of like school, but not really because it was more about the challenge where it was like we every five days we had a new shoe we had to make from scratch basically so it would be like first day you would get a brief then you would kind of you know develop the narrative start the sketching and you had a you know a material design a um footwear design and a brand design person and then you had pattern makers um and kind of like mentors that would would help you along the way so and the pattern makers would help us actually like make the shoe. And some people were more hands-on than others, but then you'd also have challenges. Like I was the brand designer. So I had to like cast models and do a runway show. And then I had to like do a social media campaign for um, like the shoe we did for Dame Lillard. And then we had to build, you know, um, product display for James Harden. So there was a lot of different elements in it. So it was pencil, but it wasn't pencil because it was, yeah. you know, in a, it was basically pencil on steroids because usually that process you would get like a month and we did it every five days <laughs> Yeah. well on TV. <laughs> yeah. It's so crazy. I mean, it's so crazy too, that, that, that even happened. Like I know. A, as a reality show, I think about it now. I mean, I think there's plenty of market for it, but it was like, I feel like it was, it wasn't that long ago, but I feel like it was also way ahead of its time to be so such a deep niche that, and then take yeah. that and make it into a reality show, which well, I totally I admire. Think, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think that's why, I mean, there was a few reasons why I think it didn't do as well. We still found a niche market. I still have people emailing me, sending me DMs, being like, oh my God, I loved you on the show or people who will meet me and then text me later, like, oh my God, I knew I knew you, but I didn't know where, but then I have this gift of you on the show, you know? Um, and I mean, I, I got a lot of camera time because clearly I'm not shy. And um, I had so much TV experience that, I, I knew how to give the right answers. Most people would just be like, no, okay. I'm like, you have to give a full sentence and then they'll leave you alone the rest of the day. Like, just give a few clips. They'll not bother us, you know? Yeah. But I also got sick and ended up in the hospital twice and had surgery later and almost died. But that's something else. But, um, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> I think it's again, that being early, you know, in the sense that people, now I think there would be more of an audience for it, you know, but it was on YouTube. They called it YouTube Red, which already people thought was like red tube porn. They didn't know what it was. They only <laughs> had two episodes without it, you know, um, and they had some decent, you know, guests come on. You know, we got to meet like Macklemore was on, Ashley Graham, Dame Lillard, you know, um, Eddie Wong. So like you had some decent talent come through, but I think it was it was early. And I think also it was just a matter of like marketing the right way. And I think they didn't really understand how to reach that ideal market. And it, you know, it, it lived on complex sneakers for a bit, but I think it would, a lot of the, the people I was on the show with, I think they thought it was going to be bigger than it was. And going in, I was like, I'm going to get a work visa. I'm going to, you know, get some more experience. And that's what it's going to be. Cause getting a work visa on my own, I knew it was going to be five or 10 grand. And at least the way the show would pay for it. And I would get to live in Portland and, Obviously, I didn't know I was going to get sick and 
that, you know, I would sleep three hours a night and it would be super insane, but it was still a great experience because I, you know, I met all these people, I got to try it, but I had to tell, you know, a lot of the, the younger people that were on the show is like, I don't, I think you have to realize like, you know, if it's not marketed a certain way, if it's not packaged a certain way, like it's just not going to go, you know, it's not like we're on ABC every night and there's putting multi-million dollars in a marketing, you know? So yeah. I think it was, it was a little harder for people who aren't working in the sneaker industry, you know, who maybe had done some courses, but weren't um, used to the marketing side of things or weren't used to how things were picked up on blogs. And I remember we had a showing at Soho house and almost the entire guest list was my friends or people that I know from the industry, because the marketing people from Google or from YouTube were just kind of like, Oh yeah. I mean, who do you think we should have? I was like, well, why don't you have all these writers, you know, who I know, why do you have all these people come in? And I think part of it, there was just that disconnect. Like, there was a part of me that I was like, oh, if you just let me run it, I was like, no, don't work for free. Don't work for free. Don't work for yeah. free. You know, but, um, but I think, I think it, again, it was that kind of like being early and people not really understanding how to do it. But that was the same with Project Runaway, right? Like the first couple seasons, people didn't know about it. And then it got steam. And I think part yep. of it is when you sign up for something to be in the first, you know, season, you have to be okay with the fact that you might not get numbers. You might not, and that someone might get it later and you can't really hold that against someone who is cast at a later time, you know? And I think yeah. that was, that was a tricky part for a lot of people. Like I, it would have been nice to get more, you know, out of it, but I kind of like, I'll use it for what it is and, and kind of move on. But that's just part of being early to something is you have to be okay with the, if it hits or it doesn't hit, you know, and just enjoy it for what it is and not expect yourself to be famous just because, you know, you sign your life away for two months. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, and I think, you know, kind of, it's just the nature of, of so many things happening, you know, where we're all yeah. creating on the internet, right? Like, you're just, you're just not going to always find the success that you personally kind of expect from things, right? Like, I, yeah. I've seen so many people, you know, start blogs, start, you know, go whole full fledged into we're going to be a sneaker blog, right? And we're going to be you know, the, the next sneaker news or the next complex or the next soul collector. And it's like, don't, I'm, I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that because the yeah. learning process that comes with it is completely invaluable. You're going to take that and you're going to turn it into whatever you do as a profession and you're going to, it's going to be well yep. worth the effort, but there will be things that are going to be super disappointing about it. And yeah. that's <laughs> also why, like for me, like with sneaker history and even outside the box and like these podcasts and like the content that we create, I'm never attached to the numbers with it. And that's like yeah. the comfort that I've found in creating without with, like, I'm not going to a Nike or Adidas and saying sponsor this, right? Because yeah. I don't want to have to play that game. I want to, if something comes up and we want to talk about it, if something comes up and I want to write about it, like I want that freedom. And that's also like the, tr the trade off of like yeah. getting the access that you would get, you know, by being connected to one of the big blogs, right? Like you don't get invites exactly. if you're if you're not like if you don't have that big kind of machine behind yeah. you, or or at least you become a less likely choice, right? Yeah. But I think it's really fascinating too because, um, you know the, the, like, it's interesting to hear you kind of talk about your steps through this, and like you've had these various places of, you know, like almost like hyper education, right? Where it's like, yeah. you know, Parsons, you know, short program, right? Like that's not mm -hmm. most people that go through Parsons don't have that short and condensed experience that you had. Same with, you know, like, I know you did pencil twice, but like, you know, you don't, I mean, the experience, you probably learned a lot more for what you do now in the school aspect of it. But the experience of being smashed into two months of recording, doing all oh, these yeah. things and all that, also gives you an insight that n like, I mean, ha what are there 15 people that are 20 people that are involved in that to yeah. in, at the level that you're involved. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And it, it makes me wonder too, like, I don't, I'm not familiar as familiar with it, but if a couple of people have reached out to me from the, I think it's the fit like sneaker essentials program or something like that. Oh been, yeah. 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 They've reached out to me too. How, how do you, how do you see the, like the like could you compare or maybe talk about the benefits of like your experience at Parsons versus your experience at Pencil and you know maybe what fit might be 
specifically because I just talked to somebody on Friday about, um, I don't want, I can't really name any names, but like, I just talked to a friend Friday about designers in the business and, you know, some designers that we know as footwear designers still cannot draw 20 years later, right? Like that's the, one of the things that you said was like learning how to work with people. And I think that probably comes from all of these different experiences, but maybe you could talk to the differences between those programs. Cause I know a lot of people are going to be listening, thinking like, yeah. oh, these are cool schools. How can I learn this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So just to clarify, so the pencil, I did pencil twice and the Parsons program was pencil at Parsons. So it okay, was Dwayne gotcha. teaching it. It was just at Parsons. Basically he had an agreement with, um, pencil goes around to different colleges and universities, um, and does like capsule. I would, that would be the closest word I would think is like, you know, one month programs. And they, I think with one of the schools in Oregon, I have to double check. Sorry to pencil if I said this wrong, but you know, <laughs> they, they have like, um, collaboration programs for like the apparel design program is with the university there, you know? So, yeah. um, but you're getting a pencil education within it. So they have different kind of like pilot programs. And I think the one at Parsons was the only one they did there. Um, but they've done this at different universities as a way to bring footwear education to a school that doesn't have it. So Parsons doesn't have a footwear program. Gotcha. But it does in their, or at least they have like an accessories design. I, I have to double check in their bachelors and then they have their sneaker program. So I think pencil, I would say would be like, it's best to go in with a certain amount of education. So I would put, and then if there's other like masters or bachelors, footwear design programs, I can't speak to those, but they would be kind of sort of on that level. Now, pencil, obviously, depending which program you take, it's usually like a month. So already you're not going to like a year long thing. And I know plenty of people on the show had done like pencil three times, you know, when I did it too, you had to pay for it. A lot of times it's either, you know, free or a scholarship or you just pay for housing. Uh, I, <laughs> I didn't say this in my co-op board interview I just had, but I, I took out a second mortgage on my house so I could go to Parsons. So I could do that because it was three grand. And to me at that point, three grand was so much money. Now I'm like, okay, a little older, understand things a bit better. But I was like, I just have to make this happen, you know? Um, so I took out on my line of credit so I could go. But um, not always a good idea, kids. But uh, <laughs> uh but that's how I was able, you know, to do it. But I would say pencil and those kind of programs are probably at the top. And then underneath, I would put maybe this foot program. Um, I know for a while, Sean Williams, they had like their obsessive sneaker design had like a program where it was more about um, like learning kind of about marketing and like how the industry works. So something like that could be a really good primer. I know they were doing it on Zoom and I think fit would be there too. If you already are like a blogger and you do some design, I don't know if the fit program's the right fit because I feel like it's more like a good overview of how things work and they do bring in speak speakers, but a lot of the speakers they bring in are more from like the blog space and are more from the marketing space. I don't know how much they have on, on the design point of view. Um, but what also might be good too is taking like, you know, industrial design courses, taking material science courses, taking patterning courses, and also just like practice. Practice, 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 practice. You know, like get a pen and like get a pencil and just sketch. You can get, um, you can, um, when Brian Foresta came and talked to us, he's not with Adidas anymore. He was like, try to design a shoe in three lines only. And that's a really good way of doing it. And he actually did it on a post it. So that's one way of like, you know, seeing if you can get the shape down. Even, excuse me, like taking, you know, printing out shoes and tracing them. Like there, there are ways to kind of start learning about shape and, and, and things like that. But I would say, you know, if I wouldn't, um, you know, bet all bet the house on maybe some of these programs for me, pencil was really helpful because it gave me an idea of like where my strengths were. But I think what to do before signing up for any of these is really do as much as you can about reading about different sections and maybe reach out to whether it's people like me or you and or like a mentor that can be like hey can you give me half an hour i'm going to tell you what i'm good at can you give me an idea of maybe what i should research and i've even done that with like vps like i i did a program uh like a research program with um lvmh and fenty and i met a former vp at nike and he kind of became a bit of a mentor to me because he was able to look at my whole career from a bird's eye perspective and understand like my value was in these intersections and and the fact that you know I can look at a shoe and be good at understanding all the details and know how all the processes work but also understand how it creates the greater message I'm like oh this is a skill so he's like yeah you are a creative director just people don't understand that word anymore because yeah. everyone thinks they're a creative director because they're like oh put that there you know like it's become a bastardized word so I think 
anytime someone is really passionate about it, I'd say a big part of it is research, you know, um, like Jeff Staples podcast has been good for that. Um, yeah, someone definitely. who, who I talked to and, and, um, she was kind of helping me a bit was, uh, was Drika, who is now the CMO at Timberland. Um, so I had talked to her through, um, my, my other contact at Nike and she's really, her episode about intersections is really interesting to get an idea of kind of how things work when Nike had the, with the energy program. Um, so I think a huge part of it is kind of understanding it. And then from there, you know, seeing, seeing where you fit in, you could do pencil without, you know, a ton of experience, but I would say maybe if like, say you're going to go for brand design, learn keynote, learn um, illustrator, learn InDesign. I learned InDesign during the show. I had worked with it a bit, but I basically taught myself at like three in the morning how to use all these programs, you know? Um, Catalina, who was on the show with me, she's like one of my best friends and she like helped me because she was in materials and color. And so we would just sit and I was like, okay, I'm gonna figure this out because my teammate fell asleep and I'm still up, it's four in the morning, let's finish it, you know? Um, yeah. I work well under pressure, <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend doing all the time because that's why I got sick, um, you know? But I think, and if you wanna do footwear design, start, you know, looking up tutorials, looking up sketching. If you wanna do materials or colors, even go to a fabric store. It's a little harder in COVID, but you can, um, some of these fabric stores like um, Swatch On from Seoul Korea, you can like order swatch packs and then just cut them up and play with them. Like find find your ways and and reach out, you know, Twitter, um, listening to different podcasts, like that sort of thing. But I would say for me, like pencil is always gonna have a place in my heart because it really helped me start my career. And I look at back a lot of the lessons I learned from Dwayne and Suzette and some of the other people there. And I'm like, damn, Dwayne is right again. Like I really had to edit. I really, you know, this past year I, I was able to get, you know, um, a diagnosis for my ADHD. And for me, you know, there was a part where I was like, oh, I wish I knew this when I was 15, but maybe I wouldn't have all these great experiences and I wouldn't have done all these different work and get me where I am now. But, you know, like Dwayne kind of saw it, but he didn't like push me. But now yeah. I understood why sometimes he and I also just have different brains, you know, and, and part of it is also learning that maybe if you really want to be a footwear designer, but you're way more better suited to color, maybe try to work with what you're naturally good at. I don't think that doesn't mean you shouldn't take industrial design courses, but, you know, try to work with how you learn and yeah. what you're receptive to. And I think part of it, too, is like you're going to have to try a ton of shit before you find what you're really good at. You know, there is so much stuff I've tried where I was like, oh, actually, I don't like this, you know, yeah. or finding different niches and where I'm at now, where I'm doing product development, where I'm doing design and, and consulting and still some styling, like I had to do a bunch of stuff to get there, you know, but part of that was process of elimination. So I think also what I always tell younger people is make a list of everything you hate. What do you not like? What do you not want to focus on? And that will help you edit. And then you'll have a long list of stuff you love, but then you'll be able to be like, oh, that job has a ton of paperwork and I'm not good at that. What can I do that maybe is more focused on visuals? Okay, you know, and, and go from there. Um, and obviously if you can intern, assist, find a mentor, you know, I always, I personally learn best like doing the job, you know, yeah. some people learn best by reading, but I, I think that's really valuable if you're a creative person to really get in there and see, see how it works. And also be realistic that you might not get paid for years. Yeah. Or you might not make good money. I think people assume like, I'm going to be a forward designer. I'm going to make a hundred grand. Like, no, they make 50 grand to start. So. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely co-sign that too. Like I, <laughs> when I, when I went to New York and worked for complex, I didn't make enough to cover my life in New York no. as an editor at complex. Right. Like I, I had to have two or three different side hustles at all times yep. to make sure that I had rent paid. So, um, well, so I'm going to go back to, you said, uh, you know, the, just like how far off the word, the term creative director is. And, um, I'm going to switch to another word that I feel is completely misconstrued is at this point. <laughs> no, but that's another, oh. one. but sustainability, right? Like sustainability yes. is a word that I feel like is for so many companies is like, oh, it's just a marketing term and we don't yes. actually have any idea what we're doing. And so if you're listening to this or, or watching on YouTube or whatever, if you haven't checked out my conversation with Jeremy Green of Calling All Creators, he had some really cool insight into this. And he like I've been thinking the same thing for a long time. And I had this experience back in like 2007 or something when I was writing for Nice Kicks. And we got a press. It was one of the first press releases I got from Nike that was like, this is a vegan Air Max 90. And mm. the shoe was not a 
yes, it was vegan technically, but it was basically all plastics, right? It wasn't a, it wasn't in any way a good thing for the environment. And it's not a a jab at Nike or anything. It's just like nobody was actually had the right mindset about these terms back then. And I think still sustainability, um, you know, Jeremy talks about like kind of like closed circle creation, right? And like having- Yeah, closed loop, yeah. Yeah, closed loop um, creation. And I think like that's, like how, you know, now that you're in this kind of a different position where you're actually getting to deal with these things and address these things on the product development side, mm-hmm. how as, you know, as most people listening to this consumers, how can they like be a part of that change of that narrative, right? Absolutely. Because, you know, the some of the brands will eventually, you know, kind of change that. But like, yeah, I feel like I'm always picking on Nike, but they're just the top dog of everything, right? But like, I look at like the, you know, whatever shoe it was that just came out and it's like 25% recycle, the Cosmic Unity. And I'm like, yeah. 25% recycle. And I'm like, okay. What about all the Nike grind stuff they did that was 70%? Like, how is this? Right, you went backwards, exactly. I'm like, okay, so so what is your experience with, you know, now working on that? Like, mm-hmm. you know, the challenges and how consumers can kind of, I, I guess like be more selective in their choices yeah. or be more supportive of the brands that are actually doing these things the right way versus just throwing sustainability in a, you know, a green label, a recycling label on their products. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great question. So not, not to be overly pluggy, but that's why I started my podcast and my newsletter because I was yelling much like why I started my original, you know, blog was because I was yelling about it all the time on the internet. And I was just getting so frustrated with greenwashing in it. So for me, the reason why I started it because I started I had I and I mean I a little background. I grew up in a super eco family. My mom is like an environmentalist and activist in that field. My dad is super left wing, you know, um does a lot of like indigenous rights work. So for us it's I've, I've always grown up with cloth bags, recycling everything, composting. Like to me, it's it's really important. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I was okay with being stuck in Portland. I was like, oh my God, everyone composts. It's great. You know, I was super excited about other people because I like go through everyone else's recycling and wash everything and make sure like, anyways, I'm a little crazy about that. So for me, it's always been a part of my life. And only in the past couple of years, and I actually looked at my pencil project that I did for the show. And it was all about like natural cork and eco materials. I'm like, oh, I've been doing this for years. I just didn't fully put it together in my brain, you know? Um, But I think that's a good question because there's a lot of greenwashing going on. And when I say greenwashing, that's kind of using basically terms to make it seem more eco. Exactly like you said about the Nike product. Oh, it's vegan. Okay, that's great for people who don't wanna use animal materials, but guess what? Um, PVC, poly, all these kind of materials don't biodegrade. You buy a pair of, you know, fake leather shoes, they'll call it my, my new hatred. We used to call it pleather. It's not vegan leather. It's only vegan leather if it's made from like Milo, which is a mus- mushroom, or if it's made from a plant-based material. Do not call plastic. And a lot of times, even if they are, you know, a bio material, they're coated in poly. So they still have a plastic material, which means they also won't biodegrade. So those shoes that you bought for 10 bucks at Zara are going to outlive you and your fucking grandchildren. You know, like that's what people forget about. Right. So in terms of making more informed choices, it's all about I try to keep preaching this kind of like less but better idea. So. For a long time, and I've talked, I was actually just talking to Russ about this the other day. We were both like, you know, you have to kind of find a way that doesn't, if you work in footwear, you work in a product space that doesn't feel wasteful, right? Like, oh, I don't want to, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, do I really want to tell people to buy more shit? Like, no, it feels wrong, right? If, yep. Especially if you have any kind of empathy and soul, it's a lot harder to be like, yeah, let me market something that they don't need, but tell them they need. So for me, it's about making more informed choices and also understanding that so going to be a bit of a nerd here. So it's like supply chain. So that's the idea of like, you know, a product is raw, it gets made, you know, it goes out to you. Sometimes it gets returned, you know, like you said, there's closed loop and open loop, right? So closed loop is when everything can be contained and you can like send the shoes back, recycle them. And, you know, they're being made from recycled sources, not virgin sources. So obviously that's where we're going to go, but it's hard for these giant brands like Nike and Adidas that forever are doing offshore, forever are working in China, and also realizing a lot of these green factories, they bought certifications, so they look eco. They're not, but they bribed enough people, 
in China and India and, you know, wherever they're being made. So it's really tricky when I see brands like Nike and I have one pair of space zippies mostly because I was like, oh, I want to review them. I want to see, but I haven't worn them in the pandemic and snowing, but eventually I will. Um, but to me, it's hard when these kind of brands sell it because it's like, how much are you actually changing in your supply chain? How much are you actually doing to make these differences? So I saw a lot of people get really excited about the space hippies or get really excited about what Adidas is doing with Parley. But then it's like, how much is it really reflected in the rest of your company? Like the new, the new Beyonce link came out, but I'm like, it's all vegan leather. It's vegan leather and it's a lot of PVC. How are you the new eco? You're trying to pitch yourself as the eco shoe competitor to Nike, but you're making a whole line of stuff made with fake materials, you know? So it's, it's really tricky. So what I would say is be an informed consumer and, and, I would say pick like three things that you really want out of your products. Are you vegan? So for you, is it okay if you're buying an engineered leather because you don't want to hurt an animal? Okay. Um, you know, do you want natural materials? Do you understand that sometimes natural materials are worse for the environment? Because like, let's say castor beans are grown and it's going to destroy the soil and then you know, um, farmers can't replant it and, and make something reusable. Or like, do you drink almond milk but then realize there's a drought in California and it's, you know, ruining California if you're eating all the almonds, you know, that's why I make my own oat milk. So it's, it's kind of like finding like, what do you really want out of your products? What's really important to you? Is it local? Is it, um, like I said, natural? Is it, you know, not ordering from offshore because shipping creates a ton of carbon? And part of it too is like, just read the products. If there's a ton of random words you don't understand, it's probably greenwashing. You know, oh, a carbon imprint and it's made with natural and all this is like, okay, but like, where is it coming from and why are you sourcing it? So part of it is just taking the time to understand where it's coming from, but also thinking about something. Like I saw someone being like, oh, it's a recycled shoe box. So it's, it's sustainability and like, most shoe boxes are recyclable as long as you like take off the plastic part. So why, yeah. why are you spinning it in such a way? And it just made me so angry. Or when I see people being like, Oh yeah, you know, it's, it's to help the planet. I'm like you're making more merch out of polyester. Like there's, there's this big cognitive dissonance right now. And I think that's really one of the reasons why I really want to work. I've really started working more in production is because there is this big disconnect between what's actually getting made and how it's getting made and the product people are getting. Because for the most part, the production is, is catching up, but the marketing is outpacing it. Where yeah. it's like, okay, we know how to tell you the spin, but we're not gonna tell you all the dirty secrets behind. And we can't expect these brands to wake up and have a completely closed loop supply chain. It's not gonna happen yet. But it's about you know putting pressure on these brands and, and um, you know asking for these things and advocating, but also looking and seeing you know what's, what's really out there. and, and um, you know, asking questions and, and seeing what's there. I think it's hard because we're in this like instant gratification thing. But I think one of the values, valuable things about the pandemic, it's forced us all to slow down. It's forced us all to like be like, okay, do I really need this thing? Because I want to save money because I don't know what's going to happen in the next year. Okay, so like, is this bamboo really sustainable? Oh, it's coming from China. And it's, you know, getting sent by Amazon. And they're, you know, not great to their workers. So do I really want to support that? Or do I want to buy something vintage? So I'm just upcycling something, you know, that's already yep. made, and I can buy it from a small business, you know, so it's it's kind of taking time and making more informed choices. And also, you know, finding people in your life that maybe have some experience there, and you can be like, hey, you know, is this okay? And I think it's kind of similar. And, and I, I don't know if you remember this, like when we were in like our teens and early 20s, like if it was organic, it was good. You know, and organic means something different in every place. And that's what sustainability is now. You know, like organic, if you yeah. go to France, is like uh, their version of the FTV, FDA certified, right? Like it's very strict. And to me, I was like, oh my God, the food tastes so good here. But because it's very, you know, um, strict about how stuff is grown and that sort of thing. But then you come here and organic's different in California. It's different in New York. It's, you know, it's the same as sustainability. So I think it's, it's about looking and actually seeing what the brand values are because that will tell your story. And one of the startups I work with, we do sustainable capsule styling and wardrobes for, for women. And so we have a whole brand guideline. So we have our values, you know, we're like, okay, we know if we, if we are doing wool, it has to be, you know, a certain kind of standard. And so certain brands aren't always going to meet for us. So that's why I tell people like, come up with like your 
your wants and your needs, you know, like, what do you really need out of a product? What would you ideally like? And that really helps with the editing process. Um, and also understanding that, you know, if it's a giant brand pushing sustainability out of nowhere, like, are you okay with this? Maybe just being part, like the whole brand doesn't actually stand for this. It's only one product. And then you have to be like, is this really true? Or is it just their version of greenwashing? Right. Um, yeah. so, I mean, that's a long convoluted answer. Clearly I thought, I think about this all the time, but a lot of my friends will send me like, oh, is this really eco? Is this really here? And you you don't always know. And so I also want to say like, don't beat yourself up too hard. The biggest thing when it comes to whether it's being more sustainable or green or whatever is little concerted efforts. And maybe it's just like, okay, I'm, I'm only going to buy bulk this week. And then you get into a routine and then you get it. And then it's like, okay, then I can add my next step. You don't have to be, you know, off the grid eco warrior in like that. It, it takes time. It takes time to research. It takes time and maybe focus on one area. Maybe it's like, okay, I want to only find shoes that are, you know, knit from recycled materials and, you know, are made in the U.S. So that's where I'm going to start this week. And maybe, you know, a few months later, it's like, okay, I want to find, you know, eco power for my apartment, you know? So like take yep. time and, and don't worry about doing everything at once. That's sustainable like even the word sustainable means like not destroying resources like not wearing yourself out so if you're wearing yourself out to try to be a better person don't do it <laughs> like that's setting yeah. yourself up for failure you know it's it's so great that you said that though because i i you know like growing up in northern california like mm -hmm. you know the, the bay area is like you know I, I can't remember when even starbucks didn't have compost you know, as yeah. one of the four <laughs> choices, right? It's just been a thing. But also being somebody who like grew up going, you know, camping and fishing and going to the coast and like all of these places that I, it's just a natural thing. But I also, I, I'm so glad you said that about like just the people beat themselves up over this because yeah. it's, it's in our faces so much that it's like just societal pressure to be like the perfect you know, vegan, sustainable, whatever yeah. the next keyword will be for, for whoever's, you know, selling you that thing. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like, you know, there are just times in life that just don't make sense. Right. Like even the, it's great that you brought up organic too, because I was just watching something in the last few days about, um, a guy that essentially lives, you know, uh, travels the world and, and just lives kind of as a nomad. Right. And his mm -hmm. whole thing is like, you know, the amount of money that you pay for these marketed terms in the United States versus what I pay for them in, you know, whichever country he's in at the time. And it's like, yeah, in the United States specifically, organic can just mean five times the price for no real like reason. Right. <laughs> yeah. And like we were talking about before we started recording, like I'm like a sucker for, you know, uh, farmer's markets. Like I growing up in Sacramento, like like tomatoes here are like a huge thing. Like I used to go to the farmer's market and I'm like the type of person that will eat a tomato like an apple and people think I'm nuts, <laughs> but it's like, it it's like nostalgic for me, you know, to get mm -hmm. like, just like straight fresh off the vine tomatoes. So, um, but I think that it's so important to like have that conversation of like, look, just, just, just be aware of it. Right. Like if you're not doing it at all right now, try it right there's so many yeah. other options out there at this point and like that's kind of the beauty of the internet as much as like i think it's been brought a lot of chaos to the world it also allows us to educate ourselves in ways that we never had the opportunity sure. before and i think you know just like i've been probably let's see it's probably been about five years where like i've been i would say like probably about 90 percent vegan like it kind of mm -hmm. ebbs and flows depending on my financial situation and where I'm living, but like yeah. all those things can play into it and like, you know, just do your best and, and you'll feel better about it. But the more you're doing it and the more you're talking about it, which is why I wanted to have you on. Like, I think these are things that we could collectively raise that conversation up in the footwear industry and continue yeah. to have them so that other people that don't think about this now on the brand side or on the production side or wherever that is, start to think about it more, start to think, Hey, I listened to this conversation and I need to think about this the next time I'm, you know, greenwashing something, right? Yeah. Um, but so I guess like that said, kind of like what is, um, you know, what is your, I guess like what would be like your your 
best piece of advice for somebody that's listening, you know, in terms of whether they want to work in the footwear business or, you know, like, I just know that you've, you've had so many, you've gone in so many different directions and to be able to kind of, to, to like, you know, it's, it's, it, the sustainability conversation is like a, a piece of it, like, kind of like, I think we have a very similar, like, this is just a part of who we are, yeah. but it's, it's not, it doesn't define every moment of my life either. Right. Like there's right. just certain times where I can be more vocal about it and get more out of it. But, um, I guess like, yeah, that, what would your, what would your suggestion be to 17 year old you looking at like the footwear business is like, what is the thing that you would be excited about and, and how would you approach getting into it? Because Twitter is obviously not the same. What is that next thing, yeah. you know, of how, how, how to get in the door? Yeah. Well, I think if, no matter what, if you want to work in footwear or not, I think something that helped me a lot was really pairing back and figuring out really what's of value to me and what really like feeds me. So what I mean by that is like, what, what do I feel best in? So for me, part of it was just like doing therapy was really helpful. Um, you know, I had tried it when I was younger and over the past year and a half, like there's such a difference. Like even my mom says it all the time and, you know, my friends will say it, I feel so much calmer, but part of it was like, I did, um, there's this like Japanese exercise called Ikigai where you kind of, you know, you fill in and figure out what is really a value to you. And so that helped me really see, and because I'm such a visual person, like, oh, I need to be creative. I need to lead and I need to find a way to help other people. So how can I do it together? So that really helped me with my own intersection of figuring that out. So that was helpful. Um, and, and I think for me, I mean, everyone's different, but for me, I think talking it out, but also visually seeing it was really helpful and getting an idea of how stuff fits together. Um, so in terms of like where, where to start, I think part of it is you do have to be okay with trying a bunch of stuff. Be okay. I know it's really easy for now for us to be like, just be patient because I was not patient at, you know, 17, um, at all. I just wanted to get the hell out of high school, you know, um, and get the hell out of my town. But I think part of it is try a bunch of different things. And like we talked about before, like make that list of like, what are you really passionate about? And also be okay with the fact, like, are you okay with, um, you know, maybe being broke for a while and not make a ton of money until you get to a certain path. Like when I moved down to New York three years ago um, and I'm moving into my own place soon, you know, I was like, oh, I haven't had roommates since I was in my early twenties and now I have roommates again. You know, am I okay with renting again? Am I okay with, um, not buying clothes. You know, I didn't really buy stuff for the first couple of years I was here outside of like what was really necessary, which was really hard in footwear because everyone's like, you got to post new shoes. You got to post it in here. It's like, no, I'm not. And it, it, it informed like now how I buy stuff, you know, and now how I'm really careful. Um, so I think really look at, you know, your values and what, what makes you feel the best when you do something. Obviously when you're like 17, you're still learning a lot. You're still getting an idea of what you're good at. Part of it, there is natural skill you know, that comes from that is intrinsic, but some of it you'll learn and you'll get better at, you know, and you'll understand things like I am good at research. But one of the reasons I'm good at research is because I worked in sports television and I part of my job was like, go learn everything you can about it, you know. Um, and for me, I guess that's why I do think therapy or or talking things out or maybe journaling is really great, because then you get to see patterns. You get to sit back and be like, oh, I, I'm really happy when I'm drawing. So maybe I can look and find a way to do that. Or maybe I don't want to turn that into my way to make money because then I it, it won't be close to me anymore. Like, and are you okay with someone coming in and being like, that drawing shit? Or will that destroy you? Like, do you are you willing to take a critique? Are you willing to, to sit back and learn? And the big thing, and I'm sure you can attest to this. I mean, I know I was a bit of a know-it-all as younger, but like, understand you're not going to know everything. Understand there's so much more to learn. And that's part of the excitement, you know, and that you don't have to all learn it at once. You don't have to stay up three nights in a row to get it. Like I get it. We have deadlines, but don't destroy yourself in the process of doing it because it will, speaking of someone who's it happened to, it'll destroy your health. Like when I was working at the, the TV station, I got hospitalized a few times for exhaustion because I was just working nonstop. And I felt like I was in this race to be the best new sports fashion person. When in reality, if I had just taken time and build it sustainably, might have been better, you know? Um, so realize that old adage of it's if it not it being a marathon and not a sprint. And learn to really enjoy 
process. Really enjoy the steps. Like that was something that going to pencil really taught me was like, oh, you know, um, I went to like the Louis Vuitton exhibit we had in New York that, that was traveling and you saw all the iterations of the logo. It wasn't like they just woke up and like, there's the LV. You know, they, it took them a lot of time to get there. And that was a great way to, for me to value revision and, and time and putting it there. So I think that's really helpful. Um, and yeah, try, try as much as you can. Um, be okay if you don't know exactly what you want to do at 17. I was almost too confident in the sense that I was like, okay, I'm going to go to sports broadcasting. I'm also going to be a designer. I'm going to do this. And now it's funny because like, that's my job. But, you know, I was so focused on having that career. Once I got through finishing college, I was like, why didn't I explore this part yet? You know, um, and I, that's why I did it later. But be okay with like, um, there's this book, actually, I think everyone should read and it. They're, they teach it. Um, or is it Berkeley, but design, designing your life. So you approach your life like a designer, like it's a, um, you know, like problem solving and this idea. And I think the best designers are problem solvers. And that's what I feel like even in doing my icky guy, I was like, oh, this is where I have the most value is creative problem solving. And that's really what I do when I'm developing. It's like finding the right factory, finding the right material. It's different ways of solving a problem in a creative way that's also sustainable, right? So for me, that's how I figured it out. But that book is really helpful. You can do like the PDFs and it helps you understand, you know, how to get more value out of it, how to approach things. And also the fact that like 70% of people don't work in the, in the field they went to school for. So if you go to school to be an engineer and now you want to, um, you know, be a broadcaster, it's okay. You know, as long as it is like it feels value in your heart and you feel like you can work and you're OK with with the process and you're OK with that, you'll get rejected sometimes. It's fine. You know, I'm sure. And people are going to doubt you and you have to be OK with that and also understand, like, not everyone's going to be super supportive of you. But if it really feeds you and you really are believing in the tr process and also that old adage of like progress, not perfection. And as long as you're working towards it every day, you'll be okay. You know, <laughs> I think, I yep. think that's really part of it is like, just don't worry about rushing it and just try a lot of things because, you know, if I had, I don't know, I, sometimes I wonder like, oh, if I had, you know, being less shy about rejection about some of my designs, where would I be now? Or, you know, where would I be if I studied something else? Like now I don't really worry so much about it because I'm happy and I'm fulfilled and I can see the long, you know, I have a bird's eye perspective. When you're at 17, everything feels like the last rejection is the end of your life, right? So I yep. think remember that you have so much time. And honestly, you can learn a lot in school, but the best learning happens outside of it. When you're really just interning or assisting and trying stuff out. And I know it's hard right now because of COVID, but now is a good time to reach out to people and be like, hey, can I talk to you for 30 minutes in Zoom? Like I, one of my mentors is like, I'll FedEx you a bag of coffee if, you know, we can talk for an hour. Like you don't have to do that. I was like, no, but I would take you out for coffee if this was real life, you know? So find ways to reach out to people. You don't have to bribe them, but you know, like people are at yeah. home. We have more time. Yeah, there's Zoom fatigue, but even if it's just talking on the phone, you know, and just bouncing some ideas off of each other. And um, one final thing I say that helps me a lot is I write down a lot of things that I'm trying to figure out the connection to and where I want to, I use, and I learned this partially from pencil is I use sticky notes. Um, but you can also use a whiteboard. And so you can kind of be like, okay, what are all my ideas for this design? Or what are all my, what do I really want out of this job? Right. This helped me when I was even doing my icky guy, like, okay, I want it to be sustainable. I want it to be, you know, forward thinking. I want this. So write all those out and then see how you can kind of form those intersections and get an idea of how they work together. Because a lot of times you might have a million ideas, but it's really hard to finalize them. I mean, this is just because my I have an I'm a neurodiverse brain, so my brain's not point A, point B. Like I'm not linear, so this might not work for a linear person. They're like, I can figure it out. You're crazy, you know. But this is what I have to do. Like I have to pattern stuff out. Like a designer, I need to see the connections, right? Yeah. So if you're having problems figuring it out, turn it into like a visual puzzle. Because that way, it's, you see where the gaps are. It's like or putting a ladder together. Like, oh, I'm missing two rungs. What do I need to get to that next set? What's that bridge? And that's where you can take time to ask people, read, like look at, also look at Nike job descriptions. Even if you're not qualified, look what you need to have that job. You don't necessarily need all of them. It's, that's like their wish list. They hire t 
plenty of people who don't have every qualification or too many qualifications and then they underpay yep. them, you know, whatever. But look at those job descriptions. What, what programs are there? Definitely learn the Adobe suite. Definitely, you know, see what you really need to know. And big companies like Nike, like Adidas, love hiring from cool upstart brands. So you might be with a brand, you're like, oh, we had to shut down, we lost money, but you did all these cool creative stuff. Nike will love hiring you because you're coming with fresh ideas. So don't be scared to work for a startup. Don't be scared to work for a small brand. Everyone thinks they're gold. Like, it's really great if you can like intern at Widen or at Nike and you are like, oh, I'm set. But I, I mean, you and I are like this. We're, we're serial entrepreneurs, right? Like we like to, this idea of creating belly stuff. Not everyone's built yep. for that because it can be pretty crazy and chaotic and, you know, not really stable. But when you're younger, you really have that flexibility, right? Maybe you can stay and live at home, save money or give your parents rent, cook them dinner, you know, show them that you have yeah. value. But during that time, you know, make sure you're contributing. But now that's a great time to go work for a company that maybe isn't as stable and you can learn different ways of doing things. And the great thing about small brands is you'll do a lot. When yep. you work for a giant brand, is that you have a very specific linear category, right? Unless you're a director, but even then it's more just checking in on people, making sure everything's working, right? Yeah. More broad. But understand that if you're a color material designer, you're probably gonna only work like, let's say in kids and in soccer. You know, it's gonna be very, you know, specific and siloed. Certain companies and certain, you know, departments are gonna be a little more broad, but understand that if you are at a smaller, more, I guess, dynamic or, you know, open company where it is more all hands on deck, you might get to try marketing, you might get to try design, you might get to try uh, buying, you might get to buy direction, you know, like there's all different areas you could try. So I think that's yep. also a really great thing is to work with one of these smaller, more mobile companies, because then you'll get a chance to try everything without having to work at like 10 companies, because that can look a little psycho on a, a resume. <laughs> but like, why did you not stay somewhere? Why did you change so much? But if you can work at a company where you can move up, and try different things. If you're still figuring it out, that's another good way of doing it. True, true. That's all great advice. Um, okay. Last question. What's okay. the dream opportunity for Megan in 2021 or 2022? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really lucky that kind of one of the dream opportunities I'm working on right now, unfortunately I have an NDA, so I can't fully talk about it, but basically we're really focused on bringing footwear and sneaker production back to the U S and, bringing back jobs here. And for me, we're, look, watching the inauguration and seeing so many small American designers, like North American designers, obviously I'd love to see some Canadians in there, but um, seeing these small brands and people who work in the garment industry or um, like Jill Biden, she wore a coat and it was mostly made of like remnants and, and stuff that was remade. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is what it means to be sustainable in a small way. Obviously it's not a big brand with Gabrielle Hurst, but to me, that was a great way of them demonstrating Here's how we're going to help, you know? Um, so for me, it would be working, it's the project I'm working on now are, you know, once we have, once I can announce it and then hopefully it becomes full time, you know, that would be one. Um, the work I'm doing with Venica is actually really exciting. That's the sustainable capsule wardrobe, getting to do so much with them in terms of like fashion direction, developing our private label line, you know, hiring stylists. Um, hi, what else do I do? I, there's so much that we do there, it's such a small team. But it's been really exciting because I've got to grow, help grow this team and then hire people who, you know, have similar backgrounds and are multidisciplinarians too. And that feels really good to kind of give back to people, even though I might not have known them before, and to work with a team of all women. And like my, the, the founder of the company, Shivika, she had the same visa as me. So we had this like, you know, immediate connection of being a couple immigrants working in fashion, trying to find a better way, you know, and, and creative problem solve. So to me, that's that's been really exciting. Um, and other than that, I would just say, you know, um, I would love to down the line, like whether it's, um, you know, collaborating on something that is more sustainable and doing more consulting and really trying to find a way to make, you know, production and make product in a way that I don't want to say doesn't hurt anyone because that's really hard, but that has a more positive impact, you know, that can ensure that workers are being paid well, that we're not shipping too far because that's not great for the environment. And I think just create, continuing to create 
uh, or solve problems in a creative way. So the work I'm doing right now is very fulfilling. I'd also like to be able to have more time to do my podcast and newsletter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think part <laughs> of it, too. my dream job is, is hiring a team, you know, yeah. because I feel really inspired. So I would love to, you know, be able to bring that to like, whether it's a studio or to collaborate with, um, you know, some producers or something like that. And I've looked into hiring people, but because my main jobs in, in Fort Worth develop and, and in fashion and, and, and I still work with NBA players, which is great, you know, but I would love to like have a, a collaboration, let's say with the NBA and help them develop sustainable jerseys with a major brand partner, you know, yeah. find ways that help shift the supply chain because it's coming, but it, you know, it's never fast enough. And, yeah. you know, Part of that too is I do some mentoring and try to find ways to give back and make sure because I'm always so inspired to see, you know, people who are so self-assured and so excited. And I don't just mean young people because, you know, you can have a huge major career change after 40, you know, just seeing yep. people do what they can and, and I think continuing to mentor. I know that's kind of a convoluted answer, but I mean, I feel really lucky because in the middle of a pandemic, I, I was able to kind of find my roles within these companies and you know who knows everything something can go under tomorrow but i feel yeah. really lucky that i've been able to have that and um one of the co-founders of the company there's this um uh word uh it's what is it it's uh i think it's Bashar, but it's like it's destiny but it's even deeper than that um and um in hebrew and it was something that i think about a lot like i found out while i was home random tangent um, that my great grandfather actually moved to New York in the early 1900s to study leather making and shoe making. And while he was wow. here, he played on a hockey team and also went to the Met Opera. That was like what he did for fun. And I come from a family that was like, and I only found this out because when I was home, my dad kept watching the free Met Opera. So he's like, oh yeah, your great grandfather used to that. And he also played for the Canadians. He raced cars, like definitely come after him and like, I have to do 8 million things and a lot of thrill seeking <laughs> stuff, you know, but I had no idea that I, yeah. and then I came to New York to, to put together sports and fashion and like arts, you know, and, and we used to have a leather making factory in St. to Saint in uh, Quebec outside of Montreal. And that eventually shut down because of pollution and stuff. And I'm like, wow, like I'm literally like my great grandfather's destiny in a certain way. Like now I'm the one in Brooklyn and I'm pushing things forward. And yeah. instead of, you know, shutting down the factory, like how could we redesign the factory? Whether it's working with, you know, engineered mushroom leather, whether it's working with, you know, bio-based materials that, you know, don't necessarily have a huge carbon imprint, all this stuff that's super exciting. So it, it, it gave me this new sense of feeling you know, in that, oh, this is, this is kind of history and I am finding there, but I would have never known it if I hadn't spent this time with my family. If I had it, you know, really being open to these other experiences and taking a call, like a discovery call that now turned into, you know, a next career. So for me, it's, it's building on that, obviously being able to talk about it, <laughs> being able to bring this product forward. Cause that's, that's part of, you know, how we're going to change things is as much as I don't want to, you know, make too much stuff and destroy it. That's how you really have these big breakthroughs and i would love to be able to like make a material that changes the game or like you know find a yeah. way that like a process that helps it and i would my dad is gonna say i told you so but like i grew up teaching snowboarding and, and mentoring and coaching and um in a, in a variety of sports outside of snowboarding and stuff but um and he's all almost everyone in my family is like a teacher or at least has some education so i would love to teach and you know mentor yeah. and, and something like that whether it's working with pencil if they're having me or, or with Parsons or, or just finding ways to like, you know, give back and help out because as much as there are days when I was like, oh my God, you know, I had to do everything by myself. Like I wouldn't be where I am without my network. I wouldn't be where I am without my, you know, opportunities and, and friends and, and stuff like that. So if there's a way that, you know, can continue to give back, I will. It's just like, I need, I need more hours in the day. <laughs> yep, definitely. That's, it's great to hear though. Cause like, that's also, my family is all educators for generations. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. And like, I feel like, you know, I'm, I've always had that. I just am trying to find ways yep. to, to <laughs> pass that, you know, that not even like knowledge, but it's more energy, right? It's like, I just want to be able to yeah. share with, with people that can take things and run with it in ways that I can't or, or don't see 
um, or yeah. maybe in experiences that I've had so they can run in the other direction, stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, well, it, it does, it does come off, Nick. I'll just say that every, if it's one thing everyone says about you, Zach, you know how to like find talent and how to help them and like help them and then like push them up and go. So know that it's, it's reflected amongst awesome. other people in the industry. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah. so let's make sure that everybody knows how to find you yeah. and, uh, we mentioned the podcast. I'll, I'll link to all the, all of it below, but the podcast, uh, obviously the website and she, she got your shields. She got game on all the social. Oh platforms? yeah. I'm not, okay, cool. I'm not giving that up. Yeah. yeah so it's uh, she got game on Twitter <laughs> and Instagram on TikTok. I think it's, she got game 85. I haven't posted a lot there, but I'm going to try to post more sustainable and, and eco tips. It's just, again, you know, part of, part of me trying to maintain my ADD is doing two projects at a time, not 10. So it's on my list. It's going to come. Um, so there in the She Got Game podcast, um, you just look that up on, you know, whatever podcast provider you use. It's on all the different platforms and the newsletter is just shegotgame.substack.com. But if you just go to meganannwilson.com, all the links are there. You can go to my main site. You can go to um, the newsletter. You can go to the podcast and find it there. And hopefully the podcast will be back um, in the next little bit. I have a couple interviews I've been waiting on. It's just, you know life got in the way and I had to focus on the stuff that was paying me today and the really pressing yep. stuff, but it'll, it'll, it'll come back. And, um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at and feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions, if you don't hear back from me in a couple of days, you know, give me 48 hours. I either respond right away or I'm like, Oh crap, I forgot. So I'm trying to get better at that. But, um, yeah, if there's any way I can help future eco sneaker people or people who are just interested, let me know. Awesome. Well, thanks for spending the time and um, thanks everybody for listening and watching wherever you're consuming this and links will be in the description for everything, wherever you're taking this in. So we appreciate you and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Bye.